The formula for many successful musicians is to take your influences and mix them together into something new and unique. And I recently watched a few documentaries and as a musician myself, I play the guitar. I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to, you know, the history of music, especially the history of rock and roll. And today I've got some great stories based on a documentary I watched on Hulu with Paul McCartney. It's kind of a docu-series. It was called McCartney 321, and it was basically Paul McCartney being interviewed by Rick Rubin, who is this famous music producer. And so if you're a musician, there are some really cool things. They dig into the music. And then the other one was called Kistory, which I kind of thought, oh, there, there's nothing here to learn. But it really was cool. And this was on A and E. And as I watched these, I was like, you know, there's some really cool lessons here that podcasters can learn from. So I'm going to share some stories, share some insights as we learn how to follow in the footsteps of super successful musicians and pull their lessons into podcasting. Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting since 2005. I'm your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you're new to the show, this is where I help you plan, launch, grow, and monetize your podcast. My website is schoolofpodcasting.com. Use the coupon code LISTENER when you sign up to save on either a monthly or yearly subscription. And also, this episode is brought to you by PodPage. Go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash try pod page. You can try it for free and make a beautiful website for your podcast in less than five minutes. I'll be talking more about that a little later, but I want to jump into this whole storytelling time. And if you're like, eh, I'm not really into this whole music talk. Again, we're talking podcasting and these are things that I kind of knew, but didn't know. And I was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So the first thing is there's a a really popular book called Start With Why. And I that's the first question when I ask somebody, they say, I want to start a podcast. I'm going to say, why? Because if you say, I don't know, it sounds kind of fun. Well, it is. But depending on what your goal is, that may not be really the answer we're looking for. But both the, the Beatles and later the rock band Kiss why they were starting a band. The Beatles loved American rock and roll. Now, this is sad in my book, but if I have to explain who the Beatles are, they're this little, four little lads from Liverpool, Roy. And if you ever notice, Paul McCartney has what I'm going to call the Forrest Gump G. He'll be, he'll say things like singing, singing. He has this, anyway, I digress. Uh, the Beatles were four guys in, based in Liverpool, England, who came to America in 1964. That's actually before my time and uh, inspired millions. People would faint when they saw the Beatles. They were huge. The uh, Kiss was a band in that started in the late seventies and is still trying to, I think they're still on their last final tour ever on as we mean at this time tour. Anyway, so the uh, the Beatles love the harmonies of the Everly brothers, the backbeat of Chuck Berry and the energy of little Richard And they wanted to be a famous rock band. That was their goal. Kiss was one of those bands who saw the Beatles perform in 1964 on the Ed Sullivan show. Now, that's not Ed Sullivan from Sonic Cupcake. That's a whole different guy who will help you with your podcast. And uh, they saw the the girls screaming and fainting. And they said, hey, we'd kind of like to do that. And so for the Beatles, though, that meant, hey, we're in Liverpool, England. We're going to have to someday get to America to do this. And Kiss had a simple plan. They said, we just want to be the best band that has ever lived. We want to make history. So they were uh, thinking a little big. And so what was interesting is I looked at these two, they had elements of same, but different. So what I mean by this is one of the things that uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon did together when they first met is they both said they were songwriters. And typically when you told somebody that you wrote songs, they'd go, oh, that's great. But like, what's your favorite, you know, soccer team or whatever? They were like, songwriter, whatever. They also bonded on the fact both of them had lost family members when they were young. 
And it's a great example of people who like to flock together that are very similar. Uh, John Lennon kind of had, a, a, understandably, had a chip on his shoulder. He lost his mother and his aunt was raising him and then she died early. So he was a bit disgruntled with life in general. You know, you, you might think that while these two people had great things in common, they both liked to write songs. They both lost uh, parents early in life. They were both very different in the fact that Paul McCartney was much more of an optimist and John Lennon was much more of a pessimist. And this is great. You want people that are the same but different. A great example of this, there's a song by the Beatles called It's Getting Better. I think it's all the time. I know that's the lyric, but anyway, and Paul McCartney says, uh, I got to get, I have to admit it's getting better to which John Lennon chimes in. It couldn't get much worse. So this kind of yin and yang, these little opposite, it, it made for a unique things. You took two things and merged them together to come together with something that was completely different. And the Beatles were really different. In fact, on a musical side, it was interesting because Rick Rubin, this music producer went through and he could listen to every single track of the Beatles, which in many cases was a whopping four, but you'd play the guitar and the drums and the vocals. And it sounded kind of poppy, almost like a folk song. And then you would put in Paul McCartney's bass and it was like, like Paul was playing on a different song. And these two things melded together, made something completely unique. Now, Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons were also similar. They both were raised pretty poor. They both loved the Beatles. They both were Jewish. They both had escaped persecution uh, by basically immersing themselves in music. They both had an insane drive to succeed. Gene had a giant love of comic books. And Paul had, again, influences of the Beatles, but he also liked Little Richard and, and Jerry Lee Lewis. So, it was interesting because it was that love of comic books that probably brought the whole makeup thing into their kind of world when it came to shaping the band. So what does this have to do with podcasting? If you decide to do a podcast, especially with a co-host, you want someone who has a passion for your topic, but you need them to bring a different perspective. And the other thing is, especially with the Beatles, there were so many bands that saw the Beatles. And they're like, oh, all I have to do is put on a suit and, and cut my hair away uh, a certain way and I'll be famous. And that is all the people that have, you know, librarians on fire, Pokemon on fire. That was a thing for a while. People just thought if I just tack on the word on fire at the end of my podcast name, I will make a million dollars. So this is the one that I actually dug into. I heard about this on the documentary. And when I looked into this, I was like, holy cow. And that is honing your craft. You know, there is the old saying, you've heard this probably a million times, that if you have six hours to chop down a tree, you should, you should spend the first four hours sharpening it. That makes sense. Well, the Beatles manager at the time, this guy named Alan Williams, got them gigs in Hamburg, Germany. And when they first arrived, they played 48 nights in a row for six hours a night. Now, here's the problem. You're not a musician, probably. And you're like going, okay, next no, no, no. We can't just like fly over that 48 nights in a row. And as a musician, there are things you have to think about. Number one, that's going to take a toll on your fingers. I'm actually right now in the process of maybe joining a band and I haven't played that much guitar in a long time. And my fingers were really sore. I can't imagine playing six hours a night, not to mention your voice of singing, your legs of standing, your brain, your brain is, is mind numbed by playing the same music over and over and over. I know for me, if somebody comes up and goes, Hey, will you play brown eyed girl? I'm like, Ugh, please no God shoot me. Um, so the mental strength to do 48 days, six hours a night in a row is huge. So by the time the Beatles had left Germany, they had completed over 1,100 performance hours. That's a whole lot of time on stage and their new manager. Cause I'm thinking after they, Oh, that was, you'll hear this, this whole thing of playing in Germany sounds glamorous and wow, I'm on stage. No, but they got a new manager who explained how they could get more gigs to more people in bigger rooms. If they just tidied up a bit. Cause when they first started, they were like leather jackets and kind of greasers uh, like back in the fifties. Cause this was the late fifties back then. <laughs> 
And so that's when they put on their suits and they cut their hair. And now not only did they stand out musically, but physically people are like, Oh, it's those guys with the hair and the suits. So keep in mind with your podcast artwork or your website, that is all part of your brand and they will see you before they hear you. But they also learned some slower songs. Why? Because that led to larger gigs. So this is where, hey, we can play these larger corporate stuff if you guys could just slow it down occasionally to do that. So the Beatles got more gigs by listening to what the customers were looking for, things like slow songs. And right now I want to tell you about PodPage. PodPage is a great way to make a website for your podcast. It's super simple. You take your RSS feed from your media host, you put it into PodPage, and it spits out a beautiful looking, super classy, super customizable website. If your person's like, "Ah, I'm not that techie, PodPage is for you. You can add guests, you can add sponsors, you can add really anything you want. Want to put a mailing list on your website? There's one built into PodPage, but you can actually add your own. It's super flexible. Want voicemail? Built in. Want to spotlight a few episodes? Built in. Want a link to PayPal or Patreon or things like that? Built in. You've got to check this out. It's free to try. Go over to schoolofpodcasting.com slash try PodPage. Just like the Beatles, PodPage is not afraid to experiment and give the audience what they want. Try it again, schoolofpodcasting.com slash try PodPage. And now let's hear how Paul Stanley used video to make him one of the best showmen ever in rock and roll. Meanwhile, in this kiss camp, They were inspired by the New York Dolls, which was this band that wore uh, makeup. And so they tried a few different versions and styles of putting on makeup in their signature look. They were playing smaller clubs and a member of their crew started filming their performances. And this is something where I say podcasters should, what I like to do is, is go and listen to an episode from like four months ago that I did. Because I can kind of listen to it with fresh ears. I can listen to it as close as I can as a listener. And so when Paul Stanley saw a video of himself, and even though he was kind of dancing around a little bit on stage, he realized, wait a minute, when you're on a stage, and this is a small club, he goes, this is not going to work on bigger clubs. He again was focused. He's like, I'm going to have to be much, much more animated. And between you and me, I know everybody says David Lee Roth was one of the best uh, front men of all time. And I would agree, but Paul Stanley was better because that man was doing it in six inch heels. And not only was he singing and he could actually sing, but he was also playing the guitar. I've seen him. It was amazing. So what, what do we learn from that? Well, number one, again, honing your craft. None of these guys were famous right out of the gate. They had to go through and tweak things. So again, your podcast is not a statue. It's a recipe. And when you first start out, there are probably going to be some things when you start out and then you get feedback from your audience that you're going to change. The other thing was the Beatles made it hard to copy because what would happen? You have to realize this is like in the the late 50s, early 60s. And what happened back then is somebody would buy an album from so-and-so. And then you would go and learn those songs. And then the uh, maybe a, a competition, uh, another band would buy another album and they would do that. And there were only so many songs because not everybody could afford to go out and buy all these albums. And so the in an attempt to maintain their sanity, because they're playing the same songs over and over and over, the Beatles started playing around with the songs they were playing. They started tweaking them and letting their creativity come in. And then they did something that couldn't be copied. What did they do? They started writing their own songs. Why? Because they were bored. (laughs) They're bored out of their gourd. And for any kind of performer, I don't care if you're a singer, if you're a podcaster, if you're an actor, if you are bored, it is going to show up in your performance. So they started writing their own songs. So they weren't bored on stage. And the other cool thing about that is by doing their own stuff, 
these other bands couldn't perform their music because, and I know this sounds weird, there was no way to record them. There was no phone in your pocket. There was no portable recorder. And Paul mentions that the reason the Beatles' music was memorable, like all these songs, between he and John Lennon, they wrote together close to 300 songs. And the reason they're memorable is because you had to remember them. And I was like, you know, that is so simple and yet so brilliant. And that's why their songs are memorable, because they had to remember them. Another thing here, and I'm really worried about even bringing this up, sacrifices. In Germany, the Beatles slept in basically what amounted to a a jail cell, this concrete room with bunk beds. There was no shower. There was some sort of, it was, they slept in this room behind a screen in a theater. And the only way they could kind of bathe themselves was in a toilet. Yeah. Uh, And I guess food was also a little scarce. Likewise, uh, kids had grown up poor and they were no strangers to disgusting practice rooms. Uh, Their manager, and don't try this at home, uh, used credit cards to keep the band afloat because they were doing well in concert, but they couldn't get their music on the radio. And it's the direct opposite of what things are today. Now you can't sell music. You don't make any money with your music, but you make money on tour. And Kiss was selling out venues because people were like, you got to go see this. They set everything on fire. So it's true. If you don't sacrifice for your art, the art is the thing that is sacrificed. I get that. And it's very true. I hate to hear the word sacrifice when people are like, well, you know, and you start sacrificing time with your family and your friends and things like that. So be very, very careful. And sometimes as artists, man, I'm an artist and I'm going to fall on my sword and I'm just, eh, don't do that. Don't sacrifice your, your family and friends for that. I realize sacrifice sounds cool and great. Don't, but nonetheless, uh, Paul and Gene from Kiss would actually go in. They would get hired at a local studio to sing backup vocals. And instead of getting paid in money, they got paid in uh, studio time. So that's how they paid for their first demo. And you'll hear more about that a little later. The other thing both these bands did is they had a clear idea of what they wanted, right? The Beatles wanted to go to America uh, and basically be a rock band. They just wanted to be a rock band, but they knew if they wanted to be the best rock band, They had to go to America. And so Gene and Paul formed a band called Wicked Lester. And this was that record that they recorded by singing backups at all times of nights and things like that in the studio. But they explained in this documentary that what they noticed is they started to sound like everyone else because they were in this record studio. So if somebody like there's a band called Jethro Tull back then that had this guy that played flute. So all of a sudden they're putting flute in their music. And then somebody else would come in, they'd have this big sound and they'd have a a brass section. So they're like, Oh, let's add a brass section. So they were following what other people were doing. And so what was interesting about this is this band, Wicked Lester, they, they recorded these demos and they actually went out and got a record deal. Now, again, let's, let's think about this. This is in the, the early 1970s. And there is no internet. And the only way you can get your music to people is to have a record deal to where the record deal has distribution throughout all the stores so people can buy your stuff. And here, Gene and Paul from Kiss have a record deal. They are, they've done it. They've made it. Oh my gosh, my record's going to go everywhere. And they went to their manager and said, Hey, we don't want to put out this album because it's not good. It's not. This is not what we have in mind. This is not what we want, right? We have a clear idea of what we're looking for, and this isn't it. And their manager said, uh, that's not happening. You've got a record deal. We're going to put this out. And Paul and Gene quit. And I was like, wait a minute. So and I'm trying to put my myself in their shoes. It's the 1970s. You've got a record deal, which is what every musician wants, and you walk away from it. I thought that was pretty Interesting, but it shows they're like, look, we know what we want. We want to be this historic band, and that music is not going to be historic. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, I also noticed that there is a little friendly competition. Uh, Both bands kind of talked about how, you know, Paul and Gene would write a song and they would kind of try to, oh, that was pretty good. I'm going to write one better. 
And likewise, uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney and the Beatles would occasionally kind of spar off with different songs. Or in some cases, you would have, uh, I know the Beatles and the Beach Boys occasionally would put out a song and they're like, oh, that's pretty good. Let's do that. In fact, uh, Paul McCartney has said, I forget the name of the band, but there was one band that said, we just put out the loudest, most rudest song ever. And the Beatles went, oh, yeah, and then went in and recorded this song called Helter Skelter, which is just mass chaos. The other thing, and this was one of my favorite stories in the McCartney documentary on Hulu, was you need to get people talking about you. So you have honed your craft and you've got it to where people are are liking it. And in this uh, documentary, it's not really about the Beatles or Kiss. It's actually about Jimi Hendrix. And Paul shares that when you're in a band, and I can attest to this, you never get to go see other bands. And he said there was this one little pub that he would go to late at night. And he said he went in one week and there was Jimi Hendrix. Now, Jimi Hendrix is a a great guitar player from the 60s, unfortunately died in uh, 1970 of a drug overdose. But he was this amazing. He's another guy that influenced a ton of people. Why? Because he was super unique. And Jimi Hendrix came in and played to like a handful of people, but he did his whole thing. So Jimmy would, would, you know, dance around, he'd play with his tongue, he'd, he'd flick out his tongue, he'd play with his teeth, he did all sorts of stuff. And even though it was this little itty bitty club, Jimmy pulled out all the stops. And then what happened is Paul said, like five days later, he played like on the weekend and he said, and the whole place was packed, including famous guitar players like Pete Townsend from The Who and Eric Clapton and all these people. And it just shows you that when you are different and when you stand out, people will talk about you. And that's what happened here to the point where everybody came back to this little pub because they're like, you got to see this guy. He's crazy. He's playing with his teeth. His guitar sounds so rude. And so when you start out and you've only got a few, you're you're telling yourself, oh, I've only got a few downloads. Remember that those few downloads can lead to a lot of downloads if those people start telling their other people. If you get asked to go on another podcast, somebody wants to interview you, and you don't know how many downloads they have, and they might have just started out. Maybe you're on episode three. It doesn't matter. You never know who's listening. This, it's it's hard to say, but I think this was the one that I went, wow, I didn't know that. And it really, really jumped out at me. And that is, I'm calling this no promotion until we've proven we're good. And I see so many people talking about this now that like, hey, I need to get Facebook ads. I need to advertise my podcast on another podcast. And everybody's talking about promotion. And I, this was the one I was like, ah, that's why the Beatles are the Beatles. The Beatles had seen other bands in England that went to America. They would arrive writing on some sort of success that they had achieved in England, only to find out that nobody had heard of them in the U.S. And so they would unsuccessfully book a tour and then return to home, you know, back to England, dejected. And Paul talks about how they were offered a tour in the U.S., but he said, not until we've had a number one song in the charts in America. And that, again, is where I go, wait a minute, you're a musician. You've recorded a song called Please Please Me in 1963. You have a song and somebody goes, why don't you go to America? And he goes, nope, not yet. Because he knew for this to be successful, I've got to have all the pieces in place. And so he said, not until we've proven that we're good. And so in his book, that was when we get a number one hit in America, then we will go there. And that's exactly what they did. So Please Please Me was a song they wrote in 1963. It would go to number one. They would not go on Ed Sullivan, which was this, again, remember, this is, again, like 1964. There were only three channels and everybody watched Ed Sullivan. So like 70 million people saw that performance, which is amazing. The other thing, and the reason why this went to number one, was both the Beatles and, of course, Kiss were trendsetters. They, their influences, um, they took them and made kind of their own sound. And, and Kiss admits that they were one of the most feared bands in the late 70s. 
people were like, oh, these guys are evil and they're, you know, breathing fire and all this other stuff. They literally like, don't let your kids go to a Kiss concert, which, by the way, is the best way to sell tickets. But in the 1980s, instead of being the trendsetters, Kiss kind of became followers. And that's when their popularity dwindled. And the story here was, how did they fix it? Okay, so we've gone from being the hottest land of the band, Kiss, to the 1980s, where we're dancing around in what looks like pink tutus. It was just, it just wasn't working. So how did they fix that? They organized meetings with their fans. They were called Kiss uh, conventions, like there's, you know, Star Trek conventions and things like that. And they went to their fans. They hung out with their fans and gave them what they wanted because the fans said, look, we really want you guys to reunite with the original members and we want you to put your makeup back on because at this point they had taken it off. And so again, they went back to their strong suits. What makes you you? Sometimes you have to embrace that. And so I thought that was interesting that they went from being followers and they were kind of trying to sound like everybody else and be a hair band. And their audience was like, look, we liked you when you were you quit trying to be everybody else. Go embrace who you are and be you. The other thing that you notice, sadly, and I've talked about this many times, is that money changes everything. And McCartney explained that it was the Beatles starting a separate business that kind of brought the Beatles down because, of course, money changes everything. It wasn't Yoko Ono. And at one point, the original members of KISS, two of them had either quit or been fired. And they were given a second chance to come back in the band. So the fans said, hey, why don't you guys reunite with those two guys that quit? And so they did. But they said, here's the deal. While you were out doing tons of coke and being an egomaniac, we've been carrying on the Kiss name. So when you come back, you're not going to get 25% like you used to. You're going to get this much money. And oh, by the way, you're going to make millions. You're going to make millions. But you're going, here are some things. You can't get drunk. You can't do this. You can't do that. They set the expectations. And what's sad is, again, money change. At first, that this worked for a little while because those guys are like, wow, I'm back to having millions in the bank. Why wouldn't you be grateful for that? But then their egos kicked in, as well did their good friends' uh, drug abuse, and they were out of the band again. So I've said this before. If you're going to have a co-host, then you need to have that awkward conversation and set up the rules and say, this is what's expected. This is what will get you fired, yada, yada, yada. And even in this case, knowing what was expected, these guys just fell back into old patterns. So the last thing I thought I would share here about this is, again, the thing I noticed here was the Beatles, especially when they were in Hamburg, And they're playing insane amounts of music every single night. They started getting creative and making these songs their own. Then they actually wrote their own songs. And over the years, they went from kind of bubblegum pop, I want to hold your hand, to some pretty psychedelic stuff. And the reason for that was the one thing that they never wanted to do was be bored. Paul McCartney said, he goes, we just can't be bored. It just, that doesn't work for us. And so... That's how they survived, by changing up songs and by not being bored and things like that. And so the other thing they did is along this time, technology is starting to change a little bit. And they started experimenting, they said, like scientists in a lab. And so the result was they they were doing things like playing music backwards. They were mixing in different instruments that nobody had ever heard of. I think they were one of the first people to record feedback on an album. And when they did all this experimentation, the release of the album, the album was called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And you go, that is a weird name for an album. And what it was is they said, hey, let's do a, a an album. You know, let's do this collection of music, but let's not do it as the Beatles. Let's forget that we're the Beatles and just do whatever the heck we wanted. And that's considered one of the best albums ever because at the time it was so experimental. And they said it was released on Tuesday. And again, this is pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, and it was released on Tuesday. They said on Friday, they went to see Jimi Hendrix play. And the first song he played 
was the song off Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So Jimi Hendrix opened up by playing a Beatles song because everybody was playing that album at that time. And why? Because they weren't bored. They tried new things. They experimented all the time. And that, when I hear that, I'm like, huh, because I'm all about, let's find a format that works and keep doing it. And that will work as long as you're not bored. But when you get bored, you're going to have to switch something up and realize that when you switch something up, maybe you try something new, maybe you make it shorter or longer or whatever. There are going to be people that don't like it when you change. That's a given. But there also, you might attract an entirely new audience. Mike Rowe, I love Mike Rowe. He does a show called That's the Way I Heard It. It used to be about 10 minutes long. Now it's about an hour. And I still listen to Mike, not as much as I I used to, because I don't like it quite as much. But there might be people that now listen to Mike Rowe who didn't used to listen to Mike because it was too short. So don't be afraid to change things up, especially if you're bored, because that will come across. Links to everything I mentioned out at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 784. You're running out of time for the question of the month. I need your answers by July 23rd, 2021. This month's question is, for whatever reason, you can't podcast anymore. What would be the biggest thing you would miss? Go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash question and be sure to mention your podcast and your website. Again, I need these by July 23rd, 2021. Go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash question. In case you missed it, it's time for a podcast rewind. I appeared on the Talk About Talk podcast talking about the communication skills that you need and the communication skills you build when you have a podcast. Here's a little snippet. All right, let's start with what you see as the most common mistakes that podcasters make in terms of their communication. So we're talking about the basics here. What do you see novice podcasters doing wrong in terms of their communication? A lot of times it'll be an interview or you'll have... uh, I always call it, you know, three guys in the basement talking about brews or whatever. But the problem is, it's the curse of knowledge. And this is where Ernie and Bert know a whole bunch about each other. And they're all talking about, remember that thing with the orange Gatorade? And then the other guy's like, (laughs) orange Gatorade. (laughs) And nobody has a clue what you're talking about. But they're having a great time. And I'm like, look, if you want to have fun in the basement, talk to your friend by all means. But just don't look at me and go, why is my show not growing? And I'm like, because nobody knows what you're talking about. I had one last night where I made it two minutes in before I finally said, that's enough. And they said something about like, are you Brazilian? And he said, no, I'm not Brazilian. And they both just broke out laughing. And I, I'm like, I have no idea why that's funny, but they can say, Oh dude, the Brazilian thing. Are you kidding me? And I'm like, yeah, see you, you don't realize that there's a whole other group of people out here that don't know about the Brazilian thing. And they just did two minutes of nonstop inside jokes. And I was just like, yeah, that's, that's not going to work. I also appeared on the Monetization Nation podcast promoting my book, Profit from Your Podcast. So to start off, can you just tell us something that you are super passionate about? Well, podcasting would be one, uh, helping people, really. My background is in teaching. I uh, taught in the corporate world for about 20 years, a lot of Microsoft Office and QuickBooks and uh, time management and customer service and things like that. So anytime I can help people, in one way or another. And I think that that comes from, I grew up kind of poor. And so there were plenty of times, I think when I was on the kind of felt like the, the guy that was on the outside looking in. And so anytime I see somebody go, well, I'd like to start a podcast, but I don't know if anybody would listen to me. And I come here, sit down, let me show you the magic of podcasting or whatever it is. I think one of the, probably one of the more things that really, I just was like proud of is I would work with a guy once when I was doing the corporate thing and we had a program to help people get their GED. And you had people that had been out of high school for years and coming back going, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. I haven't been in school for, you know, 20 years or whatever. And you just walk them through it. And eventually, you know, it's, it's funny when how many times people have convinced themselves they're no good at math. 
oh, Math and I are not friends. And then you're like, no, let me show you. It's it's not as hard as you think. And it's just a, once you get that attitude turned around, people can do anything. So I think that's right now. Uh, and, and it has been for years. I just like helping people. One last tip here. It's a quick one on my YouTube channel. I have a, my latest video is about using a show player. Now, if you're not familiar with that term, that's where you paste a bit of code on your website and it shows multiple episodes of your podcast. And what's great about these is you can kind of set it and forget it, which sounds phenomenal, except for one thing. Try sharing an episode in a show player. It's kind of impossible. And one of the ways that you grow your audience is by other people telling other people about your show, which is kind of hard if you can't share it. So does that mean show players are bad? Absolutely not. They're a great way to binge a podcast, but I would not have them as the only way to listen to your show. Because really what a podcast episode is, it's a blog post with a player. Now, I realize behind the scenes, the whole podcasting part of the podcast is the whole syndication with the RSS feed and things like that. But when it comes to your website, you know, the thing that Google finds, it needs something to find. And when you put a show player in, can we get our geek on for just a second? It's in an iframe. So I know it looks like it's on your website. It's not. It's actually on your media host website. You want a, you want to treat every episode like a blog post, put in maybe a paragraph about what the episode is. So people know what they're going to be listening to because nobody gets on the bus if they don't know where it's going. And then I have links to everything that you mentioned in the podcast. And I am finding more and more that I find great podcasts and I go to share it and I can't. Or I have to go, go to this page. It's the 14th episode on the player. That really doesn't work. So I've got a video on my YouTube channel that talks about that. And one more time, you can find that at schoolofpodcasting.com slash 784. Everything you need is out at schoolofpodcasting.com. If you're ready to start your podcast, I've got a link there. If you want to join the newsletter, it's there. If you want to subscribe or follow to the show, it's there. Schoolofpodcasting.com. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for joining me on my mission to rid the world of boring podcasts. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. Yeah, yeah, yeah.